we go. So tonight we're going to talk about strategic framing for climate change communication. And this is all done through the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, which is an organization that was started with an NSF grant with the New England Aquarium. And the idea was to train up uh, zoo and aquarium and science uh, scientists on strategic communication practices around climate change so we can help people understand it better so that they will want to take action. And part of the reason uh, the impetus for this organization getting together is that through lots and lots of research, uh, mostly with the Frameworks Institute, um, along with a few others, that 70% uh, of Americans think climate change is happening now, yet only 65% of them really discuss it or only occasionally discuss it. A lot of people are really nervous about it, uh, don't feel knowledgeable or confident. And so really this program came about to help people increase their confidence to help change those conversations and make them more common. Particularly zoos and aquariums are extra important in this because we have a huge reach. AZA, zoos and aquariums in the United States see more people than all of professional sports stadiums filled combined. We also know that we are a very trusted resource for people about conservation, sustainability, and helping our planet stay healthy. So we have a really unique opportunity to help our guests visiting our institutions uh, and each other help increase and stretch those strategic framing muscles and gain our confidence. So the mission of NOKI, like I was saying before, is that uh, together we can train enough voices and proven communication techniques to shift the national conversation about climate change to be more positive, civic-minded, and solutions focused. And today we're gonna to go through very briefly, uh, just a little introduction on some of these techniques. Formally, I went through a six month long training program where we really dug into each of these techniques and I offer one day workshops or presentations like these short lunch and learn kinds of stuff um, for other organizations as well to help them. Part of our what happened after I came out of that training is as an institution, I felt it was important that we have a climate change position statement. And in 2012, this is what we came up with with help from our PR department, that scientific consensus holds that climate change is interrupting natural cycles, causing habitat loss and prompting more extreme weather patterns. All of this affects animals. As a conservation organization, the St. Louis Zoo has a responsibility to constructively engage in climate change solutions. And what has come out of this is a lot of training for a lot of staff and volunteers and the Climate Change Task Force, which is now the Climate Change Communication Committee and Climate Solutions Day and these webinars that we're doing for you all. And it's so great to have such a good showing. So to dig into these strategic communication techniques, let's first agree to a common vocabulary as there is a lot going out there. Part of the reason we're using climate change instead of global warming is because it's a little more accurate for what's happening throughout our planet. Global warming is still a thing. The planet is warming. However, there's a lot of change. And in some areas, cold is getting colder. In other areas, hot is getting hotter. But really what's changing is temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, and pressure. And we know this after taking averages over 30 years. And this is where people get a little confused about weather versus climate. So climate is um, basically your personality. It doesn't really change over time, but you have these moods and that's weather, right? And as the climate warms, more evaporation happens off of our water, which is what causes more extreme weather events, is it puts more moisture in the air and more heat in the air, which causes more mixing um, with colder air causing more extreme storms. So weather and climate are connected. Many people think that there's weather, there's the climate, there's the ocean, and they haven't quite connected the dots. And what this training really does and what we're talking about tonight is how to help people connect those dots in a way that will, uh, make them feel hopeful. And at the end of your conversation, you're feeling hopeful as well. 
So where do we start? It's important to know how people think because it helps us construct and deliver our messages for highest impact. If we're not being relevant to someone and their life and what they value, we'll miss everything. Um, relevance in any message, in any type of interpretation, which is what we do and uh, our team does at the zoo, must be relevant to the person. They have to connect it to something they already know if we want them to make change. So what is strategic framing? How do we help people do this? It is a research-based approach that's proven to bridge the gap between the scientist and public understanding, help the public understand the mechanisms of climate change. That's very key. People need to know the cause and effect if they wanna implement change. Show the public how they can be heroes of the climate change story, because it's really big and bad out there and we wanna make sure people don't shut down and get overwhelmed. And we want to leave the visitor and the interpreter so in this case, whoever you're talking to and you with a sense of hope. And these will go over strategies on how to do this. So we do have to consider how we talk. So I want you to just take a minute um, and think about why we might want to avoid using a crisis, the sky is falling tone of voice in our messaging, even though it is a crisis. We want to avoid a crisis tone, I hope you're all were thinking about, because we want to be neutral, reasonable, and explanatory in our messaging conversations. If you come at somebody with the sky is falling, chicken little, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world, it's a disaster, have you heard about what's happening in Africa? It gets to be too much, too far away, too big, I'm just one person, I gotta get to work, people will shut down and put up a wall. But if you are reasonable, you keep people from going into that space of thinking about too many things and this big horrible thing going out in the world. And you keep them on track and you keep them in the space of thinking strategically and in a solutions minded way. So just for example, I have a little video here that uh, the Climate Change Task Force, or now the Climate Change Communication Committee, created with AZA uh, to make two minute videos using strategic framing to talk about climate change. So we're gonna watch this and what I want you to keep in mind as we watch it is the tone and the type of explanations and things we cover in a two minute video. Pollinators such as bees need our help to feed the world. We care about making good decisions now to avoid problems in the future, to safeguard future generations of bees and people from the harmful effects of climate change. As we go about our busy day getting things done, a problem is occurring that is impacting pollinators like bees and our food supply. When we burn fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas to power our lives, we are releasing more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, where it traps heat like a blanket. It's getting thicker, causing our climate to change, our planet to warm, and disrupting the regular systems that pollinators and we rely on. Pollinators such as bees, birds, butterflies, and bats are flying from flower to flower in search of food, and at the same time, pollinating the plants that make the fruits and vegetables we like to eat. They are constantly on the job, working to provide for their family as well as yours. Bees and others pollinate 70% of the food we eat. A warming planet means that the plants that bees, birds, and bats pollinate are flowering before they are able to get to the flower. They are missing the pollination window and can't do their job of feeding their family and yours. We can help them though. Farmers can plant native plants around their farm fields, which will actually increase their yields. We can all look for open public spaces to start a community garden and plant native plants. And we can try to shop locally for our food. Farm stands and farmers markets are a great place to get all kinds of produce, cheese, and meats. If you shop locally, your food doesn't have to travel so far, which helps by reducing the amount of fossil fuels needed to get your food to you. 
So we can all make a difference for pollinators by taking action together to reduce our use of fossil fuels and provide pollinators and us with a healthy planet. So while you're going about your day, remember to be kind to bees to ensure a better future for us all. That was a fun video to make. I hope you noticed that that video really had three components to it, which is our story of climate change. We wanna tell a complete story. We need to know why it matters to society. We need to know how it works and how do we improve the situation? That's our solutions piece. So we're gonna go through each one of these very briefly to give you a little bit of background uh, and some tools in the conversations that you have with people in your life. So here's our toolbox. There's a lot on this slide, I know, but it's really broken up into those three components. So on the left, you have the why does it matter to society? And we have two what are called universal values that no matter where you're from in the world or how you grew up, everyone has an idea about responsible management. Um, or someone has an idea about protection. We may define them slightly differently, but the concept is the same. In the middle, we have how does it work? These are things like the heat trapping blanket that you may have heard in that video, which uh, we'll have a slide about specifically. But climate change is also impacting oceans uh, very in, in a lot of ways, but primarily with ocean acidification, which is like osteoporosis of the sea, where the ocean is becoming more acidic as carbon dioxide mixes in with it. And what happens is just like osteoporosis is a breakdown of the calcium in uh, bones, that same calcium is what shellfish and small invertebrate animals use to grow and, and be the basis of the food chain. The other thing we have is regular versus rampant carbon dioxide, which talks about the difference between the regular cycle of carbon dioxide that we have on this planet and the rampant carbon dioxide that's being produced with the burning and usage of fossil fuels. The climate's heart connects the ocean to the climate. The ocean is like the climate's heart. Just as your heart moves the blood around your body, the ocean moves currents of warm and cold water around the body, around the planet, which impacts uh, the climate. And what these all are explanatory change. They're connecting the dots and the mechanisms for people. And we always want to have solutions specifically at the community level. And community level solutions doesn't necessarily mean running out and running for mayor, although you could if you wanted to. But it's really about joining others in solutions that are helping the planet. Individual solutions are great. You've gone out and bought a Prius. You've put solar panels on your, your house. And that's all really important in showing the people around you that taking those measures is important to you. But climate change is so big, the biggest impact we'll have on a day-to-day -day basis is for all of us to get together. And so by you all joining these webinars that we're doing all week, and hopefully you'll join us on Sunday for Climate Solutions Day at the zoo, you are joining people in helping solve climate change, <laughs> right? Because if we all work together and all talk to each other, we can all make a big difference. So why does it matter to society? Let's dig into these values. It's the first part of the story. It's why someone should care about climate change. If you don't clue them into this first, they will tune you out. It is a common mistake, and I am very guilty of this, to simply assume that someone you like cares about the same things that you do. <laughs> Very, very common, and I'm sure all of us have occasionally been very surprised when someone we know says something and you go, wait, what? You don't think? That's interesting. So that's where these universal values become really, really important, is they help prep the heart and the brain for caring about something. And it aligns that issue with something someone already cares about. So you're not competing for time and attention with other issues in their lives. And that's really what strategic framing is. It's helping set the stage for having a really good conversation with folks. So like I was saying, we can't assume that everyone cares about ocean and climate change for the same reasons we do. And the Frameworks Institute 
did a lot of research to find out how best to connect with people. And they found out that when it comes specific to climate change, uh, there are two key values that we need to pay attention to. And you, you should use one or the other because that's about all the human brain can handle. But first we have the protection value, which basically is that something matters because we have a duty to safeguard the well being of people and places. And you can say those words exactly, or you can bring it up in other ways by talking about protecting and preserving the habitats and ecosystems we depend on, by showing concerns for others as the right thing to do, stepping in to ensure people's safety and well being. Let's take measures to eliminate or reduce risks, and let's be vigilant in shielding people and places from harm. Secondly, we have responsible management. Something matters because taking common sense steps today is in the interests of future generations. Be careful about future generations and protection because we want to protect for future generations, but it gets a little confusing for folks and there's way deep research on that, but we don't have time for it today. But in responsible management, we can bring up this value in a few different ways as well, that we should be responsible when it comes to the environment that we should look ahead to handle problems before they get worse. Responsible managers keep an open mind, look to evidence and take a level-headed step-by-step approach. And that future generations depend on the decisions we make today. These values become especially important when you don't know the person you're talking to. <laughs> Uh, here at the zoo, we see just about everybody and only for a few minutes. So it becomes really important and we rely heavily on these universal values to help make sure our conversations stay reasonable and relevant to the people we're talking to. So like I said, values can be raised in many ways. You can use synonyms, think about explicit and implicit references use idioms that appeal to the value, reinforce that value through your word choice. That's what strategic framing is. And it's a lot of practice. It's a little like learning a new language. And the more you do it, the better you get. You can reinforce them or illustrate the value through images as well. So that's the part of the story of why does it matter to this society? Why should I care? Now let's talk about how does it work? Right, We know that people don't really understand the cause and effect. They've sort of heard things. There's, you know, like the hole in the ozone layer and pollution and stuff. So I always liked this comic book of <laughs> these two people watching a polar bear with sunglasses on a tropical island. And uh, the one of the first people says, why don't the greenhouse gases escape through the hole in the ozone layer? because that's an entirely different issue. I will say the hole in the ozone layer is a pretty incredible example of the global community coming together very, very quickly and all deciding all together to ban uh, the chlorochoro, uh, the CFCs that were causing that hole. And now it's largely resolved. It's a really incredible example of the global community coming together look what we can do when we all come together. So one of the best and simplest ways to connect the dots of fossil fuel use and climate change is with, with the metaphor of the heat trapping blanket. And I have a lot of scientists who get a little upset because they say it's more complicated than that. However, <laughs> most people don't have a PhD in climate science. And you have to make this big abstract idea concrete. Again, you have to connect it to something people know. It's the door. It's the entry level to expanding that conversation, to helping them explore those ideas and maybe learn something new. So this is the how does it work in our toolbox. And we're going to really sort of look at the heat trapping blanket out of all of these today. And part of the reason, again, like we were saying, is helping people connect the dots about these, the cause and impact of climate change is what you hear on the news and what you read in the newspaper doesn't ever really focus on the cause and impact. You just hear about the impacts. 
And it doesn't really give people a sense of how they can, where they fit in the story and how they can help. So a crucial piece of this information has been left out of the conversations and the reporting. And here's how we can help bring that back. Again, it makes an abstract idea concrete and sticky. They'll remember it better. It helps people understand the mechanisms at work. When linked to causes and impacts, they motivate productive consideration of multiple solutions. Uh, Frameworks did some on the street interviews where they ask people what causes climate change and all the answers are very confused and people are not confident and they, they're not really sure. And then they read them the heat trapping blanket statement and ask them to describe it. And you have people instantly with very little prompting say, oh, we should have more public transportation. We shouldn't drive as much. They immediately go to solutions because they finally know because of this thing, this thing is happening. We should probably not do that thing anymore. So here's what the heat trapping blanket metaphor says. When we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas to power our lives and transportation, we release a lot of extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere where it gets stuck and acts like a blanket trapping heat. This blanket is getting thicker and causing the climate to warm and our systems to change. You can say this a number of different ways in a conversation you're gonna be going back and forth with people, but the really important piece is burning fossil fuels and you do kind of have to say coal oil and natural gas, releasing lots of extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere where it's trapping heat and acting like a blanket that's getting thicker. When you do that, people get heat and a blanket <laughs> and that uh, we need to make that blanket not as thick. So that's the how does it work piece. Now, part of the reason why we're all here and uh, looking forward to Sunday for Climate Solutions Day at the zoo is about how do we improve the situation? So now we have, why does it matter to society? That protection and responsible management value. Why should I care? We've got the explanatory metaphors, that heat trapping blanket, how does it work? Because of burning fossil fuels, the blanket that surrounds the earth is getting thicker and getting hotter. How do we improve the situation? When you're having a conversation, you don't have to go in this order. However, it helps us tell a complete story. So those community level solutions, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's about joining others. Climate change is so big and so abstract and the global scale and what can I, Hannah Phillips do sitting in, in you know, St. Louis, Missouri do about this global problem? It's really, really overwhelming. And what gives people hope and motivates is joining others because we know there is no silver bullet. It's lots of people doing lots of things together to make a change. So when we look at solutions, they are a frame element that fosters hope and instills a sense of agency and efficacy, meaning I can do that. The story that we're trying to tell is that concern for our climate is normal and action on climate change is happening all around us. We can come together as citizens to address climate change and help change the decision-making context so that the sustainable choice is the easy choice for more Americans. And the little red uh, arrow down at the bottom explains when we do what's happening above, we are driving people away from thinking about what can I really do? And I'm just an individual and politics as usual. And even if we do our part, there's other countries that won't. It's big and scary and depressing. And there's a crisis and climate change is natural. So perhaps there's some fatalism in there. Just clean it up, nature's self-correcting. Solution is recycling. So it's great that everybody recycles. And there are some areas in this world where recycling is not a thing, even here in Missouri, but it's a really big walk to go from recycling to solving climate change. It is, however, a default for most people when you say, what do you do for the environment? They say, I recycle because we've been hearing that message over and over and over and over again. And that's really great. It shows that they care. And thank you for doing that. 
But did you know that there are organizations working to make other changes, such as cleaning up streams and taking a pledge not to use plastic bags, which is a fossil fuel product, to bring reusable bags to the supermarket. So directing people away from that individualistic one thing to joining others um, really makes a huge difference and really gives a lot of hope to people. In our conversations with folks, we do try to focus on energy and we are focusing on carbon dioxide. Many of you know, I'm sure that there are lots of other um, heat trapping gases, water vapor is the heat trapping gas, nitrogen um, and methane we hear a lot about with industrial farming. But for most people on a day-to-day -day basis, the carbon dioxide burning fossil fuels is where they can make the most impact. Additionally, with methane, it's about making good choices about where your meat and food comes from. And part of the reason we do this focus on energy is because it's collective, it's local, and it exists. So one way people can help show and join others that energy efficiency and shifting our energy to more renewable resources is important is when you get that electric bill, there's often a little box that you can check that says, I want, you know, to have my energy come from renewable sources. And it's such a tiny additional rate. Many people, I don't know anybody who ever really sees a huge difference in their bill by checking that box. But you're continu continually telling our energy companies that it's important that we shift away from coal, oil, and natural gas to more renewable resources. So let's summarize. We want to be specific when we're talking to people about climate change. We want to use concrete examples to help show that, that change is possible. We want to be explicit about how people can work together to push the solution forward. We want to reinforce those other frame elements. We want to queue up that responsible management value or the protection value to remind people why the action matters, why they should care. It also helps explain how the solution helps reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. And most importantly, in my opinion, we're all in this together that concern for our climate is normal inviting people to talk to others, avoid polarizing language. The Yale Project for Climate Change Communication uh, is a fabulous site that you can go to if you Google, you know, do the, your search engine for it. Uh, it comes right up, does amazing regular research on people's views and attitudes towards climate change. And the vast majority of Americans are totally on board with it and would like to see changes happen at the national level with our civic leaders. But more recently, they have done a research about people talking about climate change. And the more you talk about it, the more confident people are about making change and taking steps for solutions and telling others. And their research supports that of the Frameworks Institute, which says that talking about climate change with others in a reasonable, accessible, and solutions-focused tone of voice and strategy is one of the number one climate change solutions we have. So the fact that all of you are here coming through this and possibly doing some of our other webinars and hopefully we'll come through on Sunday, you are part of a, a group of people who help get the message out that not all is lost, that we're all in this together and there are people who care and we can all help each other make those changes. Additional research by the Frameworks Institute and they dig real deep into language and word choice um, and their research is available on their website. But to keep you out of the swamp, getting stuck in a conversation where you feel like you can't dig yourself out, there are certain words that help keep, help keep people from either being amygdala hijacked or queuing up not really good thoughts. So here are some of the words that we should substitute. 
instead of saying politicians, which I can tell you for me cues up a whole bunch of ideas, we should refer to folks as civic leaders. Rather than talking about policies, we should talk about approaches. Rather than talking about laws, we should use the language around programs. When it comes to regulations, we should really just state the city or the name or the town. And instead of saying the word government, we should use the word municipal. Reinforcing a solution with a value and explanation also helps you steer clear of what we call the swamp, which I'm sure some of you have been in conversations where you think it's going really well, and then suddenly it takes a left turn and you don't know how to get yourself out. Looking at these strategies will help you do that. Also, you should know as you practice these conversations, you are going to mess up. I still make mistakes and I've been doing this a long time. And just know that that's okay. The more you do it, the better you get. So now that we know about why does it matter to, this, to me, the heat trapping blanket mechanism and solutions, let's watch our little video again and see if you can identify each of those frame elements as we go through. Pollinators such as bees need our help to feed the world. We care about making good decisions now to avoid problems in the future, to safeguard future generations of bees and people from the harmful effects of climate change. As we go about our busy day getting things done, a problem is occurring that is impacting pollinators like bees and our food supply. When we burn fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas to power our lives, we are releasing more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, where it traps heat like a blanket. It's getting thicker, causing our climate to change, our planet to warm, and disrupting the regular systems that pollinators and we rely on. Pollinators such as bees, birds, butterflies, and bats are flying from flower to flower in search of food, and at the same time, pollinating the plants that make the fruits and vegetables we like to eat. They are constantly on the job, working to provide for their family as well as yours. Bees and others pollinate 70% of the food we eat. A warming planet means that the plants that bees, birds, and bats pollinate are flowering before they are able to get to the flower. They are missing the pollination window and can't do their job of feeding their family and yours. We can help them though. Farmers can plant native plants around their farm fields, which will actually increase their yields. We can all look for open public spaces to start a community garden and plant native plants. And we can try to shop locally for our food. Farm stands and farmers markets are a great place to get all kinds of produce, cheese, and meats. If you shop locally, your food doesn't have to travel so far, which helps by reducing the amount of fossil fuels needed to get your food to you. So we can all make a difference for pollinators by taking action together to reduce our use of fossil fuels and provide pollinators and us with a healthy planet. So while you're going about your day, remember to be kind to bees to ensure a better future for us all. All right, did you all catch that? <laughs> I hope you did. Oh, I hope it doesn't play again. Ah, there we go. So this little chart here um, is one way to look at solutions. So how do we move from it's just me to we are in this together? And one thing we strive to do, uh, particularly on Climate Solutions Day, is provide uh, a venue for lots of different organizations and vendors in all different sectors to kind of come together and showcase the work they're doing and how you may be able to get involved with them. And these are just a few examples of kind of the big sectors that we think about when talking about climate change and solutions is the energy sector, transportation, food and landscaping, homes and buildings, manufacturing products and services, and waste management. And we have these three different columns about community. So thinking neighborhoods, schools, institutions, workplaces, public spaces. 
know that your book club is a community, that your place of worship is a community, your neighborhood, your school, and then moving up to the city level and the state and regional level. I wish I could give you a straight list to fill in every single one of these little cells in this chart. I can't. But as you do your own research and hopefully come on Sunday, uh, you can help fill in this chart. And you're not going to necessarily fill in every single box for every single sector. But the idea is that this is where you're thinking and you get a couple of those solutions in your back pocket that you're able to pull in your conversations with folks. And that's the other relevant piece is that these solutions, when you provide them to people, they need to be achievable for that person. So in your conversations, if you have somebody who's struggling with food security, thinking about climate change is gonna be really difficult when they really just want to figure out how to put food on the table. And so a solution there might be to find out where they're from, talk about an organization called a Red Circle, who's done webinars for us in the past and I think will be there on Sunday, which is working in food desert areas to get in community gardens and promote healthy eating that is local and easily accessible for folks who don't normally have that. And perhaps that someone could find that kind of thing in their area to tap into. So it's about providing examples for folks um, and understanding that everybody's in a different spot and everybody will be able to do what they can with what they have. Um, so having just a few examples to provide for folks will, will help you in those conversations. So I've said it a whole bunch of times, but one more plug, Climate Solutions Day at the St. Louis Zoo. It's this Sunday, September 25th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can find out information, see past webinars, um, as well as webinars from this week uh, to be posted later at www.stlzoo.org slash climate change. So again, just to pull it all together, we need to consider that people don't care about the same things that we do. And to help make sure you're setting the stage for your conversation well, tapping into those universal values around protection or responsible management, helping them connect the dots and explaining how this all works, the cause and effect and what the impacts are and really how do we improve the situation? That solutions focus. We're not here to convince people it's happening because it is. And honestly, the vast majority of Americans already agree that it's happening. The very few less than 10% that are in the denier or dismissive category, although loud is such a small portion that it's not, not something to really be worried about. The 80, and up percent are in the cautious, I'm not so sure, I just need someone to help me understand it category. And that's really where our efforts lie is helping people feel good and confident in talking about this so we can engage them in those different solutions. And that's just about the end of our presentation. So here are a few additional resources. Noki has a website at climateinterpreter.org where it's a free website, it's also free to join, where you can find all kinds of strategically framed articles, curriculum, videos, uh, opportunities for joining one of their trainings. Uh, they're hosting one now, so you could give this presentation if you go through their training. There's also a short free online course, and the link is there. And really most importantly, practice, practice, practice. So just try the heat trapping blanket on one person, see how it goes. <laughs> then maybe you ramp up to values, but just try pieces of it. You don't have to do the whole thing all at once. Sometimes you only have a minute or so to do one thing with a person um, and practice. And if you know other people who are on this webinar, get together with them and talk about your experiences because that's really how we get better. You know, I tried the heat trapping blanket with this person and it did not go well. Really? Because I did it and it worked great. I did this, what did you do? Um, really helps us all be better in our confidence in doing that. And then you're welcome to contact me if you um, are looking for a lunch and learn kind of a thing at your organization or would like more information about Noki or any of these things, my contact information is below.
So thank you everyone for your time. Again, Climate Solutions Day is Sunday, this Sunday, the 25th from 10 to three, come on by. And I'm going to end sharing my screen so we can all come back up. Thanks for your time, everyone. We do have time for some questions. We do. So if you have any questions or any topics that you would like um, Hannah to address or us to discuss um, in the 15-ish minutes we got left, uh, please throw it in the chat or the Q&A. And while folks are thinking about any uh, questions or thoughts they might have, I just want to emphasize what you said, Hannah, about um, you know, meeting people where you're, where they're at. And that's, that to me has always helped me in my climate communicate, climate change communication journey is just knowing and understanding. And like you said, it doesn't take hours of discussion. You can ask some pretty targeted questions and get an idea of where people are at. And then you can just using these techniques, just help move them along and what I like to call their climate mitigation journey, because you know <laughs> everybody's somewhere, right? Everybody's somewhere on it as a journey. And, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about it that way, it's, you don't feel such pressure to like, you know, meet somebody and, you know, they're buying an electric car tomorrow or whatever, you know, it's, it's more like having a conversation and thinking of it as a journey. That's helped me a lot. So I just love the way that you frame it as, as that, as not, and not just a, you know, checking the box or no or anything like that. And I learn a lot in those conversations too, because I've had some people go, I, I didn't even know about that. That's a great idea. Thank you so much. And I end up feeling really good. One thing we talk about in interpretation, um, because not everyone can speak tree, is that everybody's on a path and everybody's at a different point on our on the path and our job as conservation communicators um, or climate change communicators or just interpreters is to help people along that path so for some folks that path is huh i didn't think of it that way cool because the idea is that they've had a nice time and that they feel good and if they feel good and had a nice time then they're more likely to come back and ask you more questions right. or go home and start doing their own research and maybe think about looking at where their research is coming from mm -hmm. and you've helped them on that path but no you don't have to go out the gate and do this whole big thing and like now go join nato and change the global economic no 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 <laughs> maybe we'll start with your pta <laughs> yeah, right yep yep kind of a thing we had a great question that I, um, if you don't mind, Hannah, I have a really good example. Um, if you don't mind me. Um, Take it away. You and I work very closely on these things. So <laughs> yeah. I know you've heard the story. Um, so the first question is, have you ever met someone who cares basically about nothing but money? How to talk to people like them? So I have um, an older brother and he has a lot of different values, but um, saving money and being very money conscious is very high up on his um, level of values. And he's not a science guy, he's actually a lawyer. Um, so he knows how to argue. And, um, but- Married to one. <laughs> yeah, very fluent in arguing. Um, and he is, you know, saving money is a very big priority for him and his family. And I've had so many conversations, well, the, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm excited. Um, we've had so many conversations, I've had so many conversations with him over the years about how different climate actions actually save you money and how, um, especially with your home. I mean, just looking at your home, there's different types of energy audits you can take that will drastically reduce your bill. Um, but the big one for him was when they got, had lots of conversations and they bought a hybrid. And because he was like, why didn't I think of this earlier? Even though we've had lots of conversations, but he's like, this saves me so much money. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's my favorite example because my brother always comes to the top of mind when I get that question. But Hannah, I'm sure you've got an example. Oh yeah, it's similar. Um, and I love that. And one thing you pointed out when you said that he's like, why didn't I think about this for? And you said, I've been telling him this for years. Is part of this 
um, all of us using the same language around climate change and using these same strategies. We know people remember things when they hear the same thing over and over and over again, a well-worn path in the brain. And for many people, we have to make a new path for them. And the best way to do that is that no matter where they, whatever zoo they're traveling and they go to wherever place, that they hear the same message. And I think that's been a tripping point for much of climate action is because you have all these different news sources and they're only talking about impacts and everybody's talking about it in a slightly different way. Um, you are now gonna start hearing the heat trapping blanket on the news because I have heard it. And then I occasionally hear some of our civic leaders who I'm like, oh, you're so close. If you just came to my training, you know, but um, really wearing down that path and saying it slightly different ways, but being consistent in that messaging yeah. really makes a difference. Yeah. And before, you know, since I've obviously been very passionate about the earth and science my whole life, and I didn't have, you know, we didn't have this training however many years ago. So I did just try to beat him over the head with like, you should care, you should care. And then when it was actually like, I didn't have to say anything about climate change. I could just say, hey, this, this, and this will save you money. And he's like, oh, okay. And there yeah. you go. You're inadvertently helping, but he's helping. <laughs> so Great. He so <laughs> there, I have, I have sort of two stories on that. And we've got one more question. This is a good question in the chat that we'll get to in just a minute. But um, is I had, I was doing this training and I was a workshop facilitator. So I've taught the six month long course and trained other people. Um, and at the time, this is a bunch of years ago and Nokia has kind of evolved and does heavy evaluation about how to make the program better. So at this time, um, a bunch of years ago, they were really hard about staying out of the economic swamp um, because it triggers in the brain, people thinking about, I can buy my way out of this situation. That's what it cues up. However, you have these tools available to you, right? And if that's where the person is, then perhaps you should talk to them from that frame of reference. But you have these tools to navigate that conversation well. Um, so I use the example of my dad's uh, first cousin, and he lives in Massachusetts, and which I just got back from, and they have subsidy programs for putting solar panels on your roof, like they will pay you to put solar panels on your roof. My parents got an energy audit and didn't do anything. And the guys came in and just re-insulated part of their house for them for free. I know Massachusetts was, I was kind of like, oh, Massachusetts. Anyway, they also have their own <laughs> different stuff. But anyway, um, so cousin Chris, who's a very affable, really nice guy, um, you know, worked and has family and it's fine. And he's sitting on his town planning board as a volunteer and the town wanted to get solar panels on some of their municipal buildings um, for climate change. And he was like, Hannah, I looked at them and said, that's part of the liberal propaganda machine. I did not bug my eyes out. I try, at least I don't think I did. <laughs> I had this, but it was a moment where I assumed he's my cousin and he's a really nice guy and you know, you probably don't totally agree, but I would think he would be on board with this too. Oh gosh. Oh, we have training, right? And so I talked to him. I said, listen, forget about the hippie environmentalists. It will save your town money. Also energy independence. Right. And innovation. And innovation. And innovation and energy independence is found in that responsible management value. So you can use innovation knowing you're tapping into that that value and so i just talked to him i was like look forget about it it's going to save your town money um it's <laughs> you're going to do so much stuff with it and he went oh done i'm out <laughs> not going to go wait. any further yep. i was only looking for oh yeah that's awesome that is an awesome example all right, in our last question, this is another really good one. Is there any particular country or place that climate change is more prominent and one that is not affected as much? You're gonna help me with this one, but I say no. Um, there are some countries and some areas that have felt more impacts sooner, but um, hurricanes, think about Katrina and Fiona that just hit Puerto Rico. 
because we have more moisture in the air and the planet is warmer, we're getting bigger, more frequent storms. And there's your weather and climate connection. Um, more moisture in the air means bigger and more frequent storms. The flood that we had, the two floods, right? We had the thousand year flood on Tuesday and then we had the next 1000 year flood on Thursday. So we should be good for like 2000 years, right? One would think. <laughs> so, um, but there's like those, that tiny island nation in the South Pacific that had to be 100% relocated thanks to Australia said, come live here because of sea level rise. Um, Boston is feel, feeling sea level rise. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, there's some towns in the Chesapeake Bay that have changed when they host their worship services around when high tide is because the tide is coming in so high it's flooding the streets and no one can get there. Um, so coastal areas tend to probably feel it more immediately than say inland places, but you have farmers um, who had a hard time getting on board with this, but are now swinging around to it, looking at the crops and the weather and what they're able to grow. The, um, if you look at that map of the different zones for growing different plants, you know, a zone one, two, three, four, five, that used to be a lot more nuanced and it's gotten more sort of broader. The, the bands are thicker and are moving up. So, um, some are super obvious, like an entire island nation sinking. <laughs> Some are a little less obvious, like I'm still growing tomatoes and that's fine, but I should be able to start growing watermelon pretty quickly. You know, um, my raspberries are coming in later than they used to be kind of stuff like that. So it's, it's really everywhere. Um, one of the biggest impacts we'll see is on the coasts with that sea level rise because anyone who lives near a river and has experienced flooding, we think of rise as vertical but when it comes to water, it's horizontal. And just a few inches can really make a huge difference. And so uh, we're gonna have a lot of people who need to move off the coasts and come inland. Um, and that is part of cities uh, mitigation and adaptation programs. So the city of St. Louis actually has a really robust, really nicely written climate change mitigation and adaptation, because at this point we're not reversing it or solving it because we're working with carbon dioxide that was released back in the 50s and 60s and 100 years ago that's still here. But we can mitigate how much we are currently producing to, so it's not so bad later. Um, additionally, we can adapt and we're making changes. So we have a lot more wind energy coming uh, through the Midwest, a lot more solar happening. Um, and with this new bill that went through there's stuff that's gonna ramp up really nicely from an infrastructure standpoint. And voting is a really key piece to all of this. You vote what you um, wanna support in terms of what you value. And so for voting for candidates that support climate change initiatives, you join others in telling everybody that this is an important issue that we care about. So there's, there's a lot you can do. Um, and a lot of people just feel it slightly different everywhere. nothing to add. Okay. That was great. No, that was great. That's exactly what I was. Yeah. <laughs> do we have any other last questions or thoughts before we're just about at wrap up time? All right. Well, I want to thank you all so much for joining us this evening, um, especially big, huge thanks to Hannah for her fabulous presentation. Um, I hope you all have some extra tools in your toolbox when discussing climate change with those around you. Um, we hope you'll be able to join us for our next two webinars this week. And like Hannah said, not shamelessly, wonderfully plugging um, our culminating in-person Climate Solutions Day celebration at the zoo this coming Sunday, September 25th from 10 to three. Thank you all. It's a safe place to practice. Yes, you can, I'll be there. We can I'll be there. Yes, we'll talk. Can do all kinds it'll be great there'll be so many great people to talk to so many things within our community um, that we'll be able that you can engage in and learn about um, so we're really excited um, to have everybody there so again thank you so much hannah thank you all for being here with us and have a wonderful rest of your evening bye